Okay, so now to finish up today's lecture, we should um, we should uh, just make some important observations. Okay, so what we've shown is that for each value of the quantum number n, okay, which is an integer, we have a stationary wave function that we solved for. These are these sine uh, n k. Uh, uh, K and X over L, okay. Uh, these wave, uh, these stationary wave functions, and they have an energy associated with those wave functions. And we drew, uh, we we had that one uh, graph where we where we actually superimposed the actual wave functions on top of the energy levels to sort of show how they correspond to each other. <clears throat> In this case, um, we already noted. That when um, when n is equal to an odd integer, so psi one, psi three, psi five, psi seven, etc., odd integers, these are actually even functions, at least with respect to the center of the well. Okay, so we discussed that, um, and uh, conversely, those wave functions that have even <laughs> integers, uh, even quantum numbers, n equals two, four, six, eight, etc. Are odd. That means they have uh, they're anti-symmetric with respect to the center of the um, of the potential well. We noted that the uh, that as the um, quantum number n increases, then the energy increases, and um, wave the wave functions the wave function acquires more nodes and antinodes um, with increasing energy. So that's one way to sort of um, should say that's one way to actually uh, qualitatively determine how much energy, how much mechanical energy, how much kinetic energy um, a, a particle has in a certain region. If you plot the wave function and it has a lot of wiggles, a lot of nodes and antinodes in a particular region, then that means that it has high kinetic energy. If conversely you find in a particular region that it has uh, that it doesn't have very many nodes and antinodes, or doesn't have any, that means it has lower kinetic energy. Okay, so the the number the the, uh, the sort of period of the oscillation, uh, or let's say the um, the wavelength of the oscillation, is related to the momentum and energy, as we know. We know uh, we know that to be true because we we um, uh, we've already discussed um, De Broglie's uh, hypotheses and De Broglie's relations. Okay, the one thing we haven't talked about is that the wave functions psi of n are mutually orthogonal mathematically. What that means is that if we multiply um, two wave functions that correspond to different quantum numbers, psi sub m and psi sub n, in fact, if we in, in a general way, if we multiply the context, the complex conjugate of one times the, times um, the wave function corresponding to a different principle up to a different quantum number, then um, that product, if you integrate over all space, is equal to one if m is equal to n, and is equal to zero if m is not equal to n. Okay, so that means that uh, just like a, when you have a dot product of two vectors, if they're orthogonal, you get zero. Here, uh, where these functions are behaving mathematically in some sense like vectors, and if you multiply them, <coughs> if you multiply ones corresponding to different um, Quantum number, then you get um, this orthogonality. Okay, so this this symbol here is called the Kronecker delta function, and again it's defined here. It's equal to zero if the indices are not uh, the same, and it's equal to one if the indices are the same. Okay, and uh, that that observation actually is an important part of of uh, uh, verifying that in fact the family of psi n, so we basically have this family of, of wave functions that are related to each other um, and they form a complete basis set meaning that they can be used to describe any arbitrary function uh, f of x that satisfies the boundary conditions. So if, if this f, if this, if this function um, has a uh, if the value of this function is zero at zero and l, as is required from our normalization and our boundary conditions, but it uh, but is otherwise arbitrary, then we can use these basis sets, the psi n's, to actually describe it. 